Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. My whole goal with this series, just to recap, is to help you become equipped and more confident and also to let you know, we have overcomplicated sharing Jesus with people and we need to be careful about not doing that. And so I've been, I've been trying to keep the messages simple and encouraging to help you see. So today, you ready for this? The title of the sermon and the, basically the, the main thrust of this whole message is, is that we're evangelizing with God. God evangelizes with us. And I don't know about you, but if you have God's help, you're gonna be successful, yeah. right? And that's, I, that's my, I believe that, I've seen it. I walk by faith that way, that God is already evangelizing. I'm just jumping into what he's already doing. I'm getting into the flow. And so let's go to Acts chapter eight. We're gonna look at scripture and study through it. I'm gonna read some and then and share some insights. And at the end, I'll give us um, some practical insight on how we can apply this in our lives. Let me give you context of where we're at. Uh, Stephen was a man full of the Holy Spirit who preached a powerful uh, message. And what he did was he literally just gave a history lesson of the life of Christ uh, through the Old Testament and the prophets and then what happened with uh, his death and resurrection. And the way he, uh, when he delivered it, the people did not like it and they stoned him to death. And the, uh, at the time, Saul was there, which we know as the Apostle Paul, and he was okay with these, this persecution until Christ changed his life in Acts 9. But in the beginning of Acts 8, we see the fruit of this persecution. Just so you know, when you persecute Christians, it actually, Christianity spreads. And so what happened was uh, this severe persecution caused a lot of believers to spread out around uh, the cities surrounding Jerusalem, not the apostles. Scripture says specifically that the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but the believers spread out. And one of those believers uh, was Philip and he went to Samaria and he began to tell people about what Jesus did. And people began to believe in Christ and he had signs and wonders come alongside him. He was casting out demons, um, he was healing people, uh, there was miracles taking place. And um, many people believed, and what happened was, though, they had not received the baptism or the power of the Holy Spirit yet, uh, and Paul and John had, or Peter and John had came down to see what was going on because it got their attention. Wow, God's moving in Samaria, which, by the way, was their enemies pre-Christ, you know, and all that. And so they want to go and see this move of God, and when they found out that they had not been filled with the Holy Spirit yet, they had the spirit of conversion, but not the baptism. They went down there, prayed for them. They received the Holy Spirit. Simon the sorcerer saw this, and uh, it was a testimony to him of, of the gospel and the power. Simon the sorcerer believed and became a Christian, but then he had some pure, impure motives of how he wanted the Holy Spirit to do things. And you know, Peter confronts him and says, hey, wrong attitude there. Uh, repent, turn away from using the Spirit's power for your personal ambition. And so it was pride issue for him. Nevertheless, though, a great revival is taking place in Samaria. <clears throat> and you think that Philip was supposed to stay there and continue to see this revival through, this awakening of the gospel. And instead, God says, go. Instead, God directs Philip to leave. And that's where we're at now in verse 26. So let's read that. As for Philip... An angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Let me pause there and help us understand what's happening. Just so you know, uh, the way Luke wrote this portion of scripture is Luke was giving you an overview of what took place, but this had not actually happened yet in the real time span of what's happening. Philip didn't know all these things until he ran up to the carriage and found these things out. So Luke, uh, Luke is just giving like an overview of what's about to take place. And so we're going to look at that. Who is this eunuch? He's a servant in the queen's um, palace 
of Ethiopia. Ethiopia at this time is not modern day Ethiopia. Ethiopia is Northeastern Africa. So this is in Africa that he serves as a eunuch and he is a treasurer. Uh, we can see that he is wealthy because he's in a carriage and he even owns a copy of the book of Isaiah, which was hard to do if you didn't have money. So he has money. Um, he, he fears God and so much and he has so much zealousness for God that he traveled all the way from North Africa up to Jerusalem to worship God. But there was still a missing piece in the puzzle for him and that is Jesus Christ. He was a Jew who believed in God, or he was a, a Ethiopian who believed in God, a Gentile, uh, wanting to be a Jew uh, and practice Judaism. And instead, he's about to meet Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we see here a zealousness for God, um, but he's still missing a puzzle piece. And now we get to see why Philip may be there and why he is there. Let's go to verse 29. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? It's a great question. The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip, right for this, what a great invitation. Just come on up into the carriage and sit with him. You just come on in, an invitation. Just so you know, do not overthink evangelism so much to the point that you think no one's gonna receive you. Philip just was received really, really well by this eunuch because God had already been working on him as he's reading the scriptures, all right? Come on up into the carriage. And verse 32 says, the passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? Let's do a pop quiz. This is in the book of Isaiah. This, this Ethiopian eunuch is by himself in a carriage reading this. Philip comes up and hears him reading this. And who is this eunuch reading about? Jesus. Okay, you're good. You know your word. And what Philip does is, Philip doesn't do a theological lecture here, uh, like in, in, a, in a college course or a university or seminary. Philip just begins to connect the dots to help finish the picture. And he explains that uh, probably more than just these verses in the Old Testament that Jesus would come to save people from their sins and that he did come, he died, he rose again and he's preaching this, okay? Now I could do that, I believe you could do that and this person simply asked this question and whatever took place next, we don't know because Luke kind of skips over the details here and, and now the man is ready to be water baptized. So apparently he has believed, he knew about water baptism. And I wanna stop for a moment and just show you how beautiful this scripture is. If we rush too quick, we will miss this. We have this great symphony or orchestra of God using angels, using a willing servant named Philip who left successful ministry to reach one person. Does that remind you of a parable of the lost sheep or what? He leaves the 99 to reach the one. It's not about him. It's not about, you know, what he's doing in Samaria. It's about the mission of God. It's not about who, what Calvary's doing compared to everyone else is doing. It's not about what you are doing or what Ryan's doing. It's about Jesus being glorified in Delaware and in the world. It's about them and them alone. What a heart, what a heart to have like Philip. A willing, obedient heart to go. And, and then there's more. The Holy Spirit's leading him and then he gets there and he's reading the Bible. So now you see the, the orchestration of God using scripture and the importance of scripture. And then you even see the listener being open to receive and inviting. Look at that beautiful just picture of everything working together. We're getting an idea of what evangelism is like right here. 
especially personal evangelism with one person. We're getting an idea that God is working behind the scenes more than we realize. So let me finish the story. Verse 36. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. So first sign of true salvation, he wanted to obey Christ's command to be water baptized. So now we see the fruit of his salvation. Verse 39 says, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Second sign of true salvation is the joy of the Lord in this man's heart. Now, what happened with Philip? Traditionally, we believe that he was teleported, literally. He was there and then he's not. And he appears in Azatos, 20 miles north of Gaza, heading back to Caesarea. Um, that's the view that I hold. I believe that God can do that. God was casting out demons through Philip's work, healing people, doing miracles. Is there a reason why God couldn't do that? What about the chariot of fire that came down and gathered the prophet? Why not? He can do this. God is God. Could it be that the eunuch was rejoicing because he saw, not only got saved, but saw this amazing sign? Could it be that the only Gentile convert in Ethiopia needed a little something to cement his faith before he headed back and was there by himself? Could it be that Irenaeus wrote later on in Christian tradition that Ethiopia did have the gospel there and it may have been through this eunuch? It could be. We don't know for sure. It's more conjecture and we would have to be there to know that for sure, but that's what historians tell us. But here's what we see. Acts 1, 8, Jesus prophesied and said, but you will receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. At this time, this would be the ends of the earth. What Luke is doing here is he's recording how God is fulfilling this mission to reach the world. And here is a man who is leaving Jerusalem and uh, in the nick of time or God's timing, God gets a hold of him before he gets home to Ethiopia. And God saves this man. Philip didn't do it. Philip didn't do it. Philip obeyed and was a vessel and an instrument but ultimately Jesus saves people. Jesus does it. And Philip had the honor and the privilege of being there because he did obey the angel and the Holy Spirit's leading. So that's, that's critical that we know that. What happened to Philip after that? Well, we only know a few things. He traveled back up north and he landed in Caesarea where he made a life for himself and a family. And we don't read about him again until Acts 21, uh, seven through eight uh, or eight through nine, where he actually has four daughters who are prophets. And so he lived his life in Caesarea, probably doing ministry, raising a family. He was a faithful servant of God. He did have the gift of evangelism. But let me tell you, everyone has Christ. If you're a believer, you have Christ. You have a testimony. You have a copy of scriptures here in America. You can also evangelize as well. Even though if you don't have the gift of evangelism, you can still share. And, and by the way, it doesn't take the gift of evangelism to answer a person's question. Who is this man? Who is the one that the scripture is talking about? So let me give some insights to help us apply. I'm already kind of jumping ahead, and that's okay. Uh, we let, let the Holy Spirit lead the services here on this and this message. But number one, uh, be encouraged. God evangelizes with you. God evangelizes with us. You have the greatest helper you could ever ask for. Amen. God, the word of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Angels might help you too sometimes, who knows? You have God evangelizing with us and God does stuff that you can't do. Like you can't change hearts. God has to prepare people's hearts. Uh, we can't force conversions or you know, 
do three steps till someone's ready to be converted. You can't, there's nothing like that in scripture. Uh, Philip didn't know that this was gonna be his experience. He just said yes to God and then found him reading the book of Isaiah and asked a really good question. Do you know who you're reading about? And, uh, and, and in, in that moment, he helps him understand. That doesn't take an evangelist. That doesn't even take a pastor or theologian or doctor in, in ministry. Uh, it takes a willing person who does know scripture, right? So, but God was convicting and convincing and opening the heart of this eunuch uh, through the word of God. And so that's key that we see that God is actively involved in evangelism. We're jumping in and joining what he's already doing. Secondly, sharing the gospel has been entrusted to us, not angels. If we read this really fast, we, we can kind of miss this point that God could have sent the angel to say all these things, but instead the, the message of the gospel has been given to us as people. Uh, Jesus was, uh, was, was God incarnate, right, in the flesh. And so now we get to see who God is in the flesh. And Jesus is the perfect example of how a human should worship God because he was perfect in his humanity, all right? So we have Jesus' example for us. I believe that also God uses us because people need to see Christ in other people. Where am I trying to say? Um, their angels don't keep showing up to people everyday life to show them how to live for Christ. When we preach the gospel, we don't just preach with our words, we preach with our lives. So God uses people. He has entrusted the sharing of his good news of Jesus to people, not angels. Now, could an angel do it? Sure, but in scripture, the examples are people. So we have the task of doing that. Philip was about to go and go make disciples. Philip revered Christ as Lord in his heart. And so he was willing to go. He was about serving God, not himself. He was about getting the gospel out. Thirdly, we don't have to wait for divine direction, but we do need divine help. Let me make sure I clarify that just in case. We don't have to wait for divine direction. What do I mean by that? All right, Lord, show me uh, a beam of light from the clouds to hit a person at Walmart today. And that's the person I'm gonna preach the gospel to. God, if I go to my neighbor's house and the mat is wet, but the ground around it isn't, pulling out a Gideon, you know, then I will tell them about Jesus. But if it's not wet, I won't, I won't. Uh, we don't always need divine direction because we have the revelation of God's word. And God's word says, go make disciples. God's word gives us tons of examples of, of believers sharing their faith and sharing and testifying and being witnesses of what Christ has done in the gospels, in the Bible, but also what Christ has done in our lives. And so that's what we're doing. We're sharing, what did Jesus do in the Bible? That's the gospel for us. And then what did he do in your life? Ryan, what do you say when you're evangelizing someone? I say those things. It's safe. I share what the Bible says and I share what he's done in my life. You can't argue with a testimony of a changed life or the works that I've seen him do or the healings that I've seen him do. And so those are the things we share. How do you know though, Ryan, that it's the leading of the Holy Spirit? I think that's a really good question to answer real quick. Uh, we see Philip was led by the Holy Spirit to go to the carriage. How did he know? Well, he had probably most likely what many of us have had, a confidence or a confident assurance, a confident assurance that he's supposed to go do that. He's supposed to go up to it. He just felt compelled that I'm supposed to go to that carriage. Now he already had an angel visit him in, in Jerusalem. He was told to go south, he did, and there's no one but this carriage. And so he also has the Holy Spirit whisper in his spirit, in his, in his body, in his heart and mind, I want you to go to that. For me personally, um, you know, by the way, we all know that God wants to love people, us to love people, right? We already know he wants us to share the gospel. Philip knows these two things as well. 
and there's no one else out there and God asked Philip to go and God's asking you to go, it, you don't have to go through a three-day fasting process to wonder at this point whether you should do it or not. You can either love or you can do whatever he says to do. All right? And by the way, Philip was led by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. So I find it in my life that it's a, a, an assurance to go forth and do it. Uh, it doesn't mean you're not a little afraid. It doesn't mean you're not a little hesitant. Uh, but we do have to walk out in faith as well. Okay, so you're gonna be prompted to do that, but you also have to walk out in faith and fulfill that this is the Holy Spirit telling you to go and evangelize or go speak to this person about Christ. Fourthly, um, it's vital that we know the word of God, isn't it? From our scripture today, we see how pinnacle, how important or pivotal the, the gospel is, that the word of God is. Here, the word of God in Isaiah is in his hands, the eunuchs, and then the word of God is in Philip. Not just the scriptures, but Jesus Christ. Okay, and Philip is familiar with this scripture because he studied the word. Now, a lot of times I lose people on this one. I lose people on this one because we think that if, if we're going to evangelize, we have to know the Bible, memorized it inside and out. How many of us have, have probably felt that way? You don't have to raise your hand, but you know, you probably feel that way. Uh, no, you don't have to have every word memorized in scripture to evangelize and share the gospel, all right? But here's the thing. If we don't know the word of God, do we really know what the gospel message of Jesus Christ is? And so I wanna encourage you for your own walk with Christ, your own walk with God, and for the sake of those that you're gonna encounter, I wanna encourage you to have a disciplined Bible time with God on, on a daily basis. Ryan, what about just once a week, maybe twice a week, all I know is study shows if you read the Bible more than four times a week, your life drastically improves, all right? You're hanging out with God. You're hanging out with his word, his guidance. I think that's a good thing. And it's, it's worth fighting through and getting through and, and developing this habit. And it's not just for the knowledge of scripture, but it's also for the direction of God and for your own relationship with him. And so I wanna encourage you to make sure you know your word um, and you don't have to have it all figured out before you go and share. Uh, people are gonna ask questions and a lot of times we can use the scriptures to help them understand. So I wanna show you something. Uh, I don't, we don't have enough for everyone, but maybe if, you have a, if you're like against shopping online so you don't wanna buy things online, or maybe you can't get to Ollie's or, or Walmart to buy a New Testament Bible. We have some out there. If you are able to purchase New Testament Bibles on your own, I would encourage you to order a few online. But God gave me an idea. What if we just start putting scripture in people's hands? And what I would do as well is, and what I'm going to do, is I'm going to put my name in there. I'm gonna put my contact information that I feel okay to put in there. And I am going to write a little prayer in there that, that, that they would come to believe in what they're reading as truth and that God would speak to them. And I want them to read the Bible and then be able to reach back out to me with questions. And by the way, you might do this and you may never see that person again, but then you see him in heaven. But if, the, if scripture was in the hands of this Ethiopian eunuch, what could happen if we get scripture in the hands of everyone around us at, at work, right, in, in our neighborhoods. It's so simple, isn't it? This could be our track. I think the Bible is the best track out there, by the way. I think it's the best track out there. <clears throat> I, I chose the New Testament because the Old Testament can be a little hard to digest for those who have never read the Bible. All right, I was strategic in thinking that and it gets right to the life of Christ and then as they believe in him, we get them a, a, a large Bible with Old Testament and New Testament, so they're going to understand even more. Uh, but why not do that? So we have some copies on the Welcome Center in the back. If you're going to have a difficult time, just grab one at least today. Pray over it and who you're supposed to give it to. 
and be ready to connect. Now listen, this is not a matchmaking dating thing. Hey. Hey, hey there. Yeah. Singles out there. You know. Let's let's keep the right motive, right? You know. Smart, but let's keep the right motive. <laughs> you know. So gentlemen, go to gentlemen, you know. Ladies, go to ladies. Unless the Holy Spirit leads completely otherwise, just remember you're putting contact info. So if you're married, you better have permission to do that. I'm being serious. All right. We want to be above approach there on that. But this is about reaching souls, not finding your soulmate, you know what I mean? So I just thought I'd put that out there. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's funny. Uh, what I see in this scripture is our next point. Um, I'm going to ask the band to come up because we're going to worship God one more time and we're going to pray together. I see that Philip ministered to the need at that time. So second, uh, uh, this is, I don't know, what, this is the fifth point I have here. Minister where people are. Uh, most of the time, you're not going to encounter someone who's got their Bible open reading it. What you're going to encounter is someone who's bankrupt of no hope, no joy, no peace, no direction. They're hurting, they're struggling. And so uh, a lot of evangelism is caring for those around you. It's ministering to the need that they're dealing with. It's loving them where they are. And I believe that even Paul himself would say, we comfort because we've been comforted, as he said that in Corinthians. And so we bring comfort to people. And it may be that you minister to someone without ever even delivering the gospel. Um, can I, this is kind of funny too, but can I just be honest with you? You know, sometimes we as Christians, we kind of get, we kind of get a bad look because We'll, we'll encounter someone who says, yeah, I'm, I'm short three days on my rent. And then we'll be like, well, you know what else happened in three days? Jesus rose again. You know, it's like. <laughs> that just doesn't sound like you really care about what they just said, you know? So for me personally, I have to trust that God has already been orchestrating this personal evangelism moment with this person and that that person is going through that trial because I'm able to bring the hope and love of Christ and the care through human, but also divine love that Christ has given me, right? That he has loved me, he has, he's been faithful to me. So I'm gonna take that moment to care for that need and then say something like this. Hey, do you mind if I pray for you right now about that? Because Jesus has gotten me through things like that too. Boom, there it is. I didn't do a cheesy thing. I didn't go, well, let me tell you about Jesus and he'll fix your whole life right now. You know, yeah, spiritually, he will fix your whole life, but they're not ready to hear that yet. They need to know that they are loved by God and we as a church can love first. Now, this since, uh, situation, Philip was ready to deliver the whole thing because the guy was primed and ready by God and you may encounter that as well. In fact, I have. And many of our people here have told me testimonies where man, Ryan, they were ready to give their life to Christ. I'm like, then you do that. You follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and how God has prepared someone for you. You know, some people uh, sow and others reap, right? Some see the harvest through. Others are planting and sowing. And so sometimes you get the privilege of, of harvesting that soul that day. Lastly, the results are between God and the listener. When it comes down to it, all you can do is do the part that God says to do. To go and to care and to share. In the end, you can pray. If they don't believe then and if they don't receive Christ then, and by the way, Pastor Coon's gonna come next week because I'm traveling with the fine arts team. Uh, just remember, and I'll get back to my point, just remember, uh, we shared our next-gen vision about pouring into the next generation. I'm, I'm walking that out first as well, and I'm involved in youth ministry, and I'm going with our, our teens because I care about them. And I want to see what God's going to do in their life. 
So I'm gonna spend a week with them and see what God wants to do in the night services and through our time together. And uh, my son's going too, but I wanna support them and be there for them and see this culture go after Christ, this generation. Amen. So I asked Pastor Kuhn to help us know how do you walk someone through a decision to follow Jesus out of uh, Romans 10. It's gonna be a great message. I'm looking forward to watching it myself. And, um, but I'll be in Orlando next week with all the, the youth. And, but here's the thing. It doesn't, when it comes down to it, I can't force the listener. I can just share and invite them to look to Christ for the hope, for the salvation from their sin, for eternal life. I can do that. But in the end, it's between them and God. God does the saving. We just do the sharing. Word, that's the way it works. Today, there may be people who didn't know God loved them so much that he would prepare a message like this for them today. Maybe you're like this, this man who is striving to be this God-fearing person but there's something missing. And that missing piece of the puzzle is Jesus Christ. And here he is, kind of an outcast in that society as a Gentile and a eunuch. There were some privileges he did not have to, be, to practice Judaism because he was a eunuch. So he had to stay in the Gentile court instead of going all the way in, into the temple. And here he is on the outer edge, going on the way back home to the outer edge, ends of the earth, and God's love is so great for him that he orchestrates everything, even way before Philip with the, with the scroll of the, of the prophet Isaiah. God is orchestrating all these things. You know why? Because God loves that one and the 99. And maybe you're in this room today and you're that one who didn't know if God loves you. I'm here to tell you God loves you. He has orchestrated your life to be here in this moment. He probably has been convincing you of your need for Christ, convicting you of sin that has separated you from God. And he's also been trying to tell you he loves you and he will change your life. And today, if that's you, he wants to be here for you and he wants to save you. He wants to change you. He wants to come into your life through the, whole, through the Holy Spirit. And so we're gonna pray in a moment for that. And I'm also, I'm talking to the church here as believers. Believers, we don't need divine, you know, angels all the time and everything, but we definitely need God's help. And I wanna pray specifically for courage. Courage to obey this because I'm tired of the devil saying that you can't do this because of this, this, and this reason. It's a lie. God handed this Ethiopian on a silver platter to Philip and Philip was an evangelist. And by the way, evangelist still needs God's, God's help and so do we. And God is gonna bring people in your life, not, maybe not tonight, maybe not tomorrow or this week, but in the future or he will soon. And he wants you to step out in faith and let him use you. Why? because he loves that person. He loves the person you're gonna see across the street in your neighborhood. He loves the person working next to you this week. He loves the person sitting in the booth behind you at your restaurant or the waiter or waitress. He loves them. Do we need any other reason? He loves them. He loved you. He loved me. We need courage sometimes to just care and love and share and step out in faith and pray for people, whatever it may be that the Holy Spirit does. And by the way, our connection with God needs to be important. It needs to be critical because Philip had a connection with God and that's why he knew to go. He saw God, he heard God through the angel, through the Holy Spirit, but he also knew the word and he knew what he was supposed to do. So if you need prayer today for salvation, maybe you're going through something right now that has completely preoccupied your life from doing these things, we wanna pray for you on that. And then thirdly, if you need courage to go out and courage to do this, we wanna pray for you. So why don't we stand together 
I'm gonna ask our prayer team to come up. Why am I having them come up? Sometimes you need to share your burdens with other believers that will encourage and pray for you. And if you need to give your life to Christ today and pray uh, a prayer to him, we will help you do that right up here. And we wanna invite you down to get prayer. Listen, uh, one of the reasons why I come to the altar all the time is because I am human and I need God's power. We all need God's help. I don't care how mature you are, how much you read the Bible, how much you pray. You do that because you know you need God's help, right? We always need more of God. And so these, these altars are open with our prayer team, our staff to pray over you for salvation, for family needs or anything you're going on in your life that has kind of kept you from focusing on these things. And as well as, and we're carrying those burdens and we need to give them to the Lord. And lastly, for the courage and the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit to minister. So we're gonna open the floor during this song and let's also worship him and let's pray for those in this room. Let's pray for our church. God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. It's powerful. It's alive and active. God, your word is worth sharing. Jesus is worth sharing. Lord, I pray you would give us the courage to do that. I pray you would save souls today. And I pray, God, that you would show us how to handle those situations in our lives that are important and our burdens, Lord, so that we could also go out and reach the loss, to take care of home base so we can also go out and reach those around us. So God, help us in all these areas because you care about every single one. And Lord, we, we pray you call people home today as we worship and as we sing, whether it's online or in this place. God, we pray for you to, to fulfill what you wanna do today by your will and by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.